The crater uh, instrument flying on board the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has, and uh, for those of you who can see up here, this is the, uh, here's the uh, plastic, the human tissue equivalent plastic, and then the charged particle detectors in stacks. And uh, I believe that this has been quite a successful and important component of the um, LRO mission. And so the performance specs, and this shows you a little more clearly how this is really done with uh, large area silicon solid state detectors and then the plastic and uh, looking both, both ways, looking upward and looking downward. If you have more questions about this, I'm probably not the person to ask, but uh, Harlan, I'm sure, would be happy to talk about that. So let's talk now about space weather, about getting, let's not worry so much about flying um, to the moon or Mars or so, but let's just bring this back to the Earth. Um, as a motivator, this is a somewhat old dated slide now, but this shows just at one orbit, the geostationary orbit around the Earth, where many communication and um, and other kind of operational satellites, commercial as well as military, civilian as well as military, operate at 6.6 uh, .6 .6 uh, Earth radii, about uh, about uh, six and a half Earth radii from the center of the Earth. This orbit is uh, very useful because spacecraft appear to stay above a given point on the Earth's surface, and so it's uh, very useful for communication, for example. So this shows how full this region around the Earth is, and it's estimated that there are over 300 billion uh, worth of uh, assets just in that one orbit alone, and uh, that's, this is just the insured civilian spacecraft. There's a lot more there than that. So um, that's one motivator for saying that there's a lot of stuff in space that we really worry about, and charged particles can have an important effect. The ANIC uh, series of spacecraft from Canada that are their communication satellites, for example, back in 1994. There were three satellites in this family. They were operating um, in uh, different locations across the North American continent, if you will. And uh, they uh, each failed in sequence. The uh, headline panic um, illustrates the effect in Canada, knocking out phones, television, radio, uh, newspapers that were transmitted via those links. And so there have been many, many examples where the space environment has been implicated um, as causing the uh, failure. And so we've tended to use our scientific uh, satellites to uh, measure and understand these effects and to make better inferences about the space weather consequences. One little satellite that uh, I like to extol, uh, operated for 20 years, called the Solar Anomalous and Magnetospheric Particle Explorer, I was involved in that one. It was making measurements at low Earth orbit, but it was really one of our best radiation belt monitors. It was also a great solar energetic particle monitor by flying around in low polar orbit. Let me see if I can illustrate. Yeah. So um, imagine flying around in a polar orbit at low altitude. So now you're cutting through the extension of the radiation belt down to low altitudes. You also, over the polar region, can measure solar energetic particles as they funnel in along the Earth's magnetic field. And you can even use it to study the coupling of those particles down into the atmosphere. And SAMPEX was used for all of that. And um, going back to an event that we talked about quite a bit in the first part of this uh, lecture um, was the effects of the Halloween storm. And up here, I think you're probably all pretty familiar with the L value, at least, the radial distance that a magnetic field line cuts through out from one is at the Earth's surface, and two is two Earth radii from the center, and so on outward. And so here you see delineated um, L value. Here's time from 1992 to 2004. Up here is the sunspot number as a black line, and red is the solar wind speed measured outside the magnetosphere. A lot of information on this chart. But what you see is the structure of the Van Allen belts, the inner zone, the slot region, the outer zone. This outer zone is highly variable, shows uh, tremendous fluctuations on a kind of all time scales. But one thing that really stands out was this time in, at the end, right at the end of October 2003 and extending uh, thereafter. A uh, huge uh, change in the radiation belt properties. The, region normally devoid of particles is filled with particles, the slot is filled, and a uh, new population is deeply injected into the inner part of the Earth's magnetosphere. 
So this Halloween storm caused uh, a huge ripples in the radiation belt kind of studies. And it also caused uh, a huge number over a course of a week or two, a huge number of spacecraft operational anomalies. And I think this was one of the storms, uh, one of the um, activities from the sun that really stimulated a lot of policymakers to think about what does space weather really cost us as a society? What does it really, what does it do? What, what are the impacts? And so um, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Research Council um, asked that a study rep uh, report be prepared, a workshop be carried out to look at what are the societal and economic impacts of space weather. And um, I was uh, privileged to be part of that and to uh, chair that for the uh, NRC. And uh, we held a workshop in 2008. And there we called together people, you know, people who are working in um, the government, in industry, and in academia, tried to look at what are the effects of space weather on the power industry, on aviation, on military systems, on global positioning satellites, to really try to do an econometric analysis. We had people, uh, I guess, who were cheerleaders for studying space weather, like myself, but we also had people who were real economists. We had people who were representatives, uh, genuine representatives of these various industries, and so it was quite a good cross-section of people. Maybe one of the most um, talked about parts uh, of, of that report, one of the figures from that report that really drove home is how interconnected our society is now. If you think about um, how dependent we all are, say on a cornerstone technology like electric power, these arrows are meant to try to indicate some of the connections that uh, really exist between different things. But if you knock out the electric power grid you uh, almost immediately have consequences on the provision of uh, potable water, on communications, uh, eventually and not too long afterwards on the fuel supply, pumping of oil and gas. Um, emergency services, emergency services really depend or they expect that they're going to be able to have electric power for operating their communication systems. Transportation certainly expects that. So you might say, well, I'm going to have a generator. Well, if you don't have fuel for your generator, um, you're not going to uh, last very long. So understanding the cyber electric cocoon that we've surrounded ourselves with and how dependent, uh, interdependent these things are is a really important message. One of the most important things, as I said, was the electric power grid. And there's been a lot of concern. There have been a lot of articles. I don't know if you saw um, just in last Sunday's paper, I think it was, in the Washington Post, there was a front page in the business section, a pretty good article about the concerns about uh, these powerful solar storms and what they might do uh, to society. But the knocking out of house-sized electric uh, transformers on the uh, extremely high voltage power grid is one of the real concerns that uh, policymakers have and should have. So the Carrington event, what about that? So about 150 years ago, um, the um, astronomer, British astronomer Richard Carrington was doing some sunspot mapping um, from his uh, home, I believe, in uh, near London. And um, he was um, amazed to see, and this is the first recorded example of someone seeing a white light flare. It was a huge, powerful flare. Um, he ran to get someone else to look at what he was seeing. And by the time he came back, it had subsided quite substantially. But for a period of five or 10 minutes, the flare was huge and bright. And then about uh, 17 hours, 17 and a half hours later, a, a very, very strong geomagnetic storm erupted um, at Earth. And so the speculation began about how this solar disturbance um, might have caused a, a powerful geomagnetic storm. In the record of um, protons, and this is, I think, taken from um, beryllium-10 records, atmospheric records, and trying to infer what the fluence of greater than 30 million electron volt protons are. Going back from 2000 or so back to that period of time, this stands out, again, like a sore thumb. And so many have argued that this Carrington event, in addition to giving rise to a very powerful geomagnetic storm gave rise to so very strong solar energetic particles. 
Now, in 1859, the technology, the internet of that age was the telegraph. That was the only kind of global scale technology that we had. And the Carrington event, the Carrington storms, were pretty interesting in that regard. They caused very strong currents to flow in telegraph lines. There was sparking in telegraph stations. Fires broke out from the sparks that uh, the, they recorded the telegraph signals on paper. The aurora were so bright in northeastern United States that people could read newspaper by the auroral light in uh, Massachusetts and other parts of North America. The aurora extended down to, um, to the Caribbean down to, and to very low latitudes uh, over uh, India as well. And uh, this was uh, generally agreed to be the strongest storm that had been uh, found in, um, in you know, sort of recent times. We, have seen nothing, we had seen nothing uh, of this magnitude um, since uh, 1859. And so this is often taken as the, the record setter, the most extreme kind of event. As was, uh, one of the questions in the er earlier part of this lecture was that uh, um, how strong might this have been? And so a lot of work was done by many scientists. Bruce Ceritani and co-workers looked at the records from India and saw that the, um, the deflection in the Earth's magnetic field is probably something like 1600 nanotesla, a very, very large deflection. They inferred that maybe the DST index, an index that measures the ring current, which you probably learned about in previous lectures, might have been something like 1700 nanotesla. But George Sisko and coworkers uh, came back and argued that um, the real value for the DST in that storm was probably about minus 850. So bear that number in mind, 850 nanotesla. We'll come back to that, that point. But what would a storm of that size, or uh, this one like was modeled by John Kappenman for 1921, which was sort of a large storm. Well, the idea, and this is again from the NRC report, is that one could knock out um, hundreds of transformers of these uh, extremely high voltage power transformers, put, uh, um, plunging large sections of North America, the Eastern United States, Maybe 130 million people might be without power for weeks, months, or years. So this leads to some of the lurid headlines that have come from the report, but uh, these are probably pretty valuable um, kind of uh, indication that the grid is increasingly vulnerable, that there could be recovery times of uh, four years to a decade maybe, and uh, that there could be trillions of dollars of losses. This uh, report generated quite a bit of interest because of the, the size of these uh, dollar figures. Um, recently, similar kinds of studies have been undertaken, for example, by Lloyd's of London. And I think they pretty much validate the point that if we had an outage of uh, electricity for periods of months or so, this would be very, very costly to society, I think you can imagine. Superstorm Sandy, for example, that occurred uh, quite recently, uh, being without power in parts of uh, of New York and vicinity for weeks was immensely costly um, effect. During the um, Halloween storm that we've talked about quite in several different ways, uh, there were uh, other very demonstrable consequences. On this, we, you can see the North America, the United States um, displayed here. What's being plotted by the color is the total electron content. So I think Jan is happy that I'm talking about uh, this. Uh, I finally have gotten to something important, I think he would say. Um, but um, blue is good, red is bad. And uh, this is really using ground-based sensors to look at up through the atmosphere, uh, measure the total electron content. Anyway, there's a system that uh, is used by the, or was uh, intended to be used by the airlines called, called the Wide Area Augmentation System to use global positioning signals to uh, be able to better uh, control and manage the uh, aircraft. And um, this was in test there, and uh, it blue was good over most of North America, and then the Halloween storm occurred, and suddenly the whole of North America had such high total electron content, such disturbance, that the WASP system was inoperative for about 30 hours during this Halloween storm. So yet another consequence of space weather. Since I'm supposed to be talking to you about energetic particles and their sort of direct effects, another indication of how one storm can really be pretty important. This is uh, 
spacecraft anomalies, and this is again from our NRC report. But here's uh, this is put together by an air, air, uh, aerospace engineer, uh, Mike Boudot, uh, who's from his own records was looking at the number of failures per year, the number of uh, serious operational problems with spacecraft. And you can see that in 2003, this spiked up more, more than doubled from the average number. Um, and that was all associated with that one Halloween storm. So pretty important consequence. So a lot of this kind of concern about charged particles and their effects really led to part of the Living with a Star, NASA's Living with a Star program, to say we really need to have a more systematic understanding of how the radiation environment around the Earth uh, changes and what we can do about it. What kind of a forecasting development can we, uh, can we have and so the radiation belt storm probes was uh, defined as a mission. Its objectives were to look at different models for how particles are accelerated, to understand um, how they're lost, uh, to uh, understand what role uh, lower energy particles acting as seeds might be. And so this mission was uh, conceived, let's say, in the early 2000s and, and uh, began to be developed uh, in about 2006, 2007. And, um, the idea was to fly two identical spacecraft, so I'm going to talk to you about this mission now. Uh, these were renamed as the Van Allen probes a short time after their launch, but they were initially the radiation belt storm probes. The idea was to measure the fields, the electric and magnetic fields, the waves, to measure the ring current particles, the very high energy inner zone. But uh, the part that I'm involved in is called the ECT suite, and uh, I'm the PI for the instrument called the Relativistic Electron Proton Telescope. And this part of the mission in particular is geared toward making continual measurements of the very high energy particles uh, in the uh, radiation belts. So this was a, um, the development went pretty smoothly. And on August 30th, 2012, the spacecraft pair uh, in the nose cone of an Atlas V rocket were launched. Very, very nice ride, four o'clock in the morning. So this was, uh, I don't know if we can turn down the lights. This is pretty neat if we can, uh, anybody know how to control the lights? Okay, okay. Uh, anyway, be that as it may. Anyway, the uh, ride into space was beautiful, uh, lit up the night sky, and uh, then the uh, two spacecraft were to be deployed together, slightly apart, and to be, um, have some initial uh, boom deployments. Um, and then they were to be put into um, geostationary transfer orbits, as shown here, to fly out through from near Earth out to the, through the radiation belts. And what we expected to see was that we would then be measuring the uh, inner zone population, the weak inner zone, and the outer zone, highly variable um, Van Allen belts. And uh, indeed, um, the, uh, everything in the deployment and initial um, release of the spacecraft and so on worked beautifully. So um, the plan had been for our instrument, REPT, to be turned on about 34 days after launch. However, um, beginning uh, early in 2012, we became acutely aware that the spa SAMPEX spacecraft that I talked to you about earlier that had been our monitor of the radiation belts from low altitude for 20 years, that this was going to finally succumb to atmospheric drag, another form of space weather and uh, that uh, it was going to re-enter the uh, Earth's atmosphere probably in the fall of 2012. So we went on quite a campaign to get our instrument, our REPT instrument, turned on as quickly as possible. So instead of turning on uh, 34 days after launch, we turned on three days after launch. And good thing we did because SAMPEX indeed, as following the predictions, re-entered on the 13th of November 2012 but we did get some great overlap data and we're uh, analyzing that now. But um, we turned on um, our instrument, our uh, REPT instruments um, on the 1st of September and we immediately found, again this is L versus time, so this is uh, most of the month of September. We turned on the instrument, color coding over here is the logarithmic scale showing particle intensity like the plot I showed you before. So we saw the two spacecraft very close together. They're over plotted here. We see the inner zone. Uh, this is at four to five MeV, very high energy electrons. We see the slot region. 
and we see the outer belt very, very energized, very pumped up. <clears throat> but almost immediately, the um, outer zone is uh, virtually depleted, except there's a population of electrons that's just there. It stays there. The rest of the belt's varying, but this um, ring of particles just stays there. Um, at first, I thought there was something wrong with our instruments, but then I got a hold of myself and said, that can't be true, so this must be something that's really there. We, start, we studied it uh, longer, and we saw that the, this is uh, three, four, five MeV kind of electrons. We saw that this belt was there, 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 there. And then it suddenly, like a knife edge, was cut off right at the end of September as an interplanetary shock wave went by. So um, it's kind of interesting to look at the data in different ways. And so I'm going to show you now an animation where we've now laid down the orbits as the spacecraft's flying through the radiation belts. You're going to see a um, color coding in the same way of the radiation belts um, laid down in a meridional plane. There'll be about three days where orbits are added and taken away. So now let's go. So there's we first turn on. We see sort of what we expect to see. Then we see that this ring population is there, and it just stays there and stays there. Now the outer belts are varying all over the place, but it stays there. And then it, uh, you'll see shortly this all shuts off. The outer belt is virtually gone. And then a new storm develops and a huge acceleration event. So just in the first month or so of operation, we saw all kinds of fascinating new uh, features. And the one that really uh, resonated with us was to see this three belt structure, the inner zone, the slot, a uh, new belt, another slot, and the outer belt. And so. This was uh, quite unexpected. Everybody told us uh, Van Allen had said there were two belts, and here there are three. And, uh, and so uh, this appeared in um, Science Magazine, both online and uh, published in the journal in 2013 here in April. So it's really quite neat to have an instrument come on and, and really start to rewrite the textbooks, in a sense, about the radiation belt science. We also worked with our colleagues, Grant Stevens and Sasha Korsky at uh, APL to plug in the data from RBSP into more global kind of models. And so there's an animation of this if anybody wants to see it, but it really um, shows quite nicely the, um, the three belt structure or the two slot structure, something that now um, I think Mary uh, Hudson and Richard Thorne and many other people are sort of puzzling over exactly how this uh, really works. Um, we know that from the observations, since we have such beautiful observations of the radiation belts up here, repeating what we said before, we, we know what the solar drivers were. We know that there are shock waves that lead to the initial formation of this. Another more powerful shock and storm that leads to the ending of this. So four weeks of this kind of behavior. And then I was interested in what Norbert was talking about for the, I think, the magnetosphere of Saturn, where radiation belts come and go as well. So we know that external forcings can really have pretty uh, profound effects on what the trap population is in these uh, regions. We also are another paper that's just been accepted in science by Jeff Reeves and, uh, and a bunch of us is about um, how the accelerator really works. We're now able to use these two spacecraft in tandem to separate space and time, to really look at high energies with exquisite spatial and temporal resolution, and to really distinguish between whether the particles are all caused by just inward radial diffusion or more due to local um, acceleration due to wave particle interaction. So I'm sure you all got quite an exposure to a lot of these kinds of issues, and I won't dwell on them here other than to say that we're very excited to have a new tool to really study the um, environment around the Earth. And I think we're going to be moving well toward the goal, space weather goal, of being able to use these now for uh, truly predictive capability. So the long-term kind of picture, uh, what about what's happening uh, over long periods of time? And I was uh, just um, want you to sort of look at this figure going from two to four to five, six, seven, up to uh, eight or nine, 10 MeV. The Earth's magnetosphere, which is sometimes dismissed by people who study uh, other planetary magnetospheres, is a really immensely powerful accelerator and a fascinating place where we can study a lot of things in detail. But here seeing that even up to uh, eight, 10, 15 MeV, 
that you can have the abrupt appearance and then the long kind of coasting and dying away and inward motion of these charged particles. So it's a great cosmic laboratory. So the radiation belt storm probes now join uh, a whole a host of other um, spacecraft, the uh, constellation of uh, the Heliophysics Observatory. And uh, we'll be working with Themis and a lot of the low altitude satellites. And in a moment here, you'll even see the geostationary operational satellites. So uh, we're in a very enviable time in our uh, space exploration history where we've got great observations of the sun. And we've also got uh, corresponding measurements near Earth. So we really can start to piece together this sun-Earth connection. And that's really what space weather is about from a scientific standpoint, at least, is to be able to understand the cause and effect, sun to earth kind of effects of uh, space radiation. And since many of these uh, spacecraft are well instrumented for charged particles, we're particularly able to study that aspect of things. So let me start to uh, wrap up here just by saying that uh, addressing space weather, I think, is one of the key challenges confronting us as uh, as uh, heliophysicists, um, understanding the sun, understanding the transient disturbances, again, how they uh, propagate to the earth, how they interact with the earth, and the consequences they may have, such things as coronal mass ejections leading to power outages. Um, one of the things we've really learned is that the kind of cartoons, um, Fran was dissecting various cartoons, and they're all deficient because the environment that we study is much, much more variable and highly structured than anything the cartoons tend to show. When we have these powerful currents flowing in the auroral regions or subauroral regions, they can dramatically affect the power grid. They can certainly cause uh, power outages and uh, disruptions of technology. Uh, this can include the kind of blackouts, but it can also uh, be severe effects on communication, the ground to ground which is something we rely on tremendously still as a society. Um, the uh, ground to aircraft and then the trans-ionospheric communication that can knock out things like the um, uh, ATM usage and other kind of uh, signal loss from the GPS satellites. It's not only the signal uh, transfers that can be affected, but of course the impacts on uh, precision agriculture, on uh, navigation at sea. And these things can uh, even lead to the loss of uh, satellites themselves, the knocking out of satellites due to uh, the kind of disruptions internal to the satellite we talked about before, as well as the degradation of the solar panels, the shortening of life. And of course, the space station, uh, we talked a great deal about the potential impacts on uh, humans in space. So all of those things are, are quite a worry, and many of them entail the effects of charged particles. So the last thing, uh, the last element I really want to talk about here for the last uh, few minutes is, um, is the suggestion, perhaps, that, well, okay, there was the Carrington event back in 1859, but what has the sun done lately? Um, why are we so worried about something that occurred 150 years ago? I want to share with you now something that happened just about a, year, a little less than a year ago. This is from the stereo ahead spacecraft. This is imaging. Um, this is the nested set of, so here's UV images. This is one coronagraph uh, from the stereo A spacecraft, and this is another. There's an active region here by the designation. It's called active region 1520. There was a very powerful solar flare. And then you can see for yourself this coronal mass ejection that blasts off um, from the sun. And um, there was, here's uh, the WSA Enlil modeling of this. So now I think you have probably seen these before, but get with me here. Look, we're looking down on the north pole of the sun. The Earth is here. Mercury is here. Venus is here. Many of the other assets we would worry about, Mars, um, these kinds of uh, missions that are in orbit around the surface of Mars are all over in this sector. One spacecraft was out in this area. That was stereo ahead. You just saw the coronal mass ejection blasting toward it. The modeling, the WSA Enlil cone model, suggests that this uh, disturbance from the sun was pretty much a direct hit on the Stereo A spacecraft. And uh, the coronal mass ejection went from the sun, first detection at the sun, out to the Stereo 
a spacecraft in 18 hours. That's almost exactly the same as the Carrington event. So this was a hugely fast uh, um, coronal mass ejection. It was clocked at going 3,400 kilometers a second, maybe 4 million miles an hour, 5 million miles an hour. And so it was a direct hit. It was a wonderful natural experiment in that everything else was out of harm's way in this other sector. There was just one spacecraft there, and that was Stereo A. So um, in a paper that we just submitted to the journal Space Weather, we've looked at that um, event, and we've asked the question, what if that had been direct, what if the Earth had been at the Stereo A spacecraft, or what if that event had occurred a week earlier, and the Earth was in the line of fire? And um, using the beacon information, sort of the uh, initial information, suggests it would have been a powerful storm. But looking at the kind of uh, worst case scenario of, the, of this event, here's the BZ component, uh, first going up to a uh, very strong positive and then very strong negative, uh, very strong BY, BZ, uh, interplanetary field. You've all studied how those magnetic field orientations are crucially important. The uh, solar wind speed. The um, event was so powerful and the energetic particles were so strong from that event that it sort of incapacitated the plasma analyzer on Stereo A. And so it was a very uh, challenging process from Tony Galvin, the PI, to reconstruct what the solar wind speed was. But it went up, the solar wind speed peaked at about 23 or 2400 kilometers per second. The density was very high. At any rate, this storm would have led, had the Earth been there, um, would have led to a DST of minus 1182 um, nanotesla. So I asked you before to remember the Carrington number of 850 nanotesla from Cisco et al. or something comparable to this maybe from Suratani et al. But uh, the point is that the largest measured DST storm of the 20th century was 589 tesla in uh, March of 1989. This storm that occurred just a year ago would have been larger, probably twice as large as anything uh, that was really seen in the 20th century. So the, uh, the question a policymaker ought to ask is, what if that storm had occurred a week earlier, or what if it had occurred at exactly the wrong time, and we had been, as a society, had been subjected to a storm of this magnitude? And uh, I would suggest that we would certainly still be picking up the pieces from that kind of event now, and that this storm occurred on the sun during what most would regard as a pretty wimpy solar activity cycle, a very modest activity cycle. And yet the sun, under the right circumstances, can muster uh, still a, a very, very powerful storm. So whether you look at the Carrington event, which was occurred during a weaker than average kind of uh, sunspot, uh, or the 1921 storm from Kaplan that we talked about before, again weaker, or this present maximum, also quite weak. There may be even a hint that weaker sunspot maxima may be capable of producing even more powerful uh, storms to be determined. So um, I would say then, let's, let's review overall what we've talked about in these lectures, that the um, interplanetary uh, Propagation, the interplanetary radiation, certainly concerns, solar flares, coronal mass ejections. The solar particles can produce uh, huge effects on space systems near Earth or throughout the solar system. Um, they can uh, mainly, uh, the main problem there is really developing uh, an adequate and realistic uh, forecasting and warning system. The um, particles in uh, the Earth's vicinity, also a significant issue. And uh, understanding those, I think we are going to make immense progress on that with the radiation belt storm probes, with the Van Allen probes in the next years. Uh, understanding the galactic cosmic rays and their uh, trying to deal with them, especially on long duration flights, um, is, uh, remains one of the real tall poles as far as uh, human exploration. And I'll just uh, wrap up by saying that um, as a person who's quite interested from a policy standpoint of how do we deal with space weather, right now we are at a, something of a golden age having this constellation of NASA satellites. But when these satellites are no longer operating, uh, what are we going to do as a society? When we lose our eyes and ears on the sun or on the near Earth space, um, I think it's a matter of great policy interest. How do we build a truly operational 
24 by 7 kind of uh, space weather system. So with that, I'll say uh, thanks, and I'll be happy to answer any more questions that I can. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's a perfect, a perfect question. And um, to the extent that I'm an engineer, I believe the right thing to do is to build systems that are immune to space weather. That's that's the only thing in the long term that uh, really can um, really protect us from the effects. Um, the fact of the matter is, every time we put some kind of new technology in space, let's say, and we were increasingly relying on surprises, and usually there's some new susceptibility that comes along. But starting with radar in World War II up to the present time, there have been all kinds of new things that have been added. And people didn't purposely build systems that were susceptible, but they did have a susceptibility. So I think the, it's always the, the interim solution is to have better prediction and, and try to deal with it. But the longer term and the proper posture for society is to try to, try to build systems that are truly immune to the effects of the space environment. I just. Yes, see, okay. But I, I don't know what Kent's going to say, but I guess I would say that uh, it's uh, generally hard and sometimes almost impossible to engineer around every space weather. Yes. Well, okay, so um, I was mentioning these uh, extremely high voltage backbone kind of transformers. As I say, they cost hundreds of millions of dollars or a couple hundred million dollars a piece. They're the size of a house. They are, there's not a, uh, you can't go to Sears and just pick one up and, you know, bring it out and install it. Uh, they ha each one is um, built specially. Um, until recently, the United States was not even building uh, these. They, they were being built uh, only abroad, I think, in um, Brazil. I think there's been a resurgence of construction of these now. So if you knock out, uh, let's say, 300 of these, which was sort of a number that was being bandied around uh, during an intense um, Carrington kind of storm, um, you've lost 300 of these transformers. You don't have a whole bunch of them. You can just go pick up and reinstall. And so now you have to build these and, uh, and gradually replace them. So um, being without the transformers means you're without power on the on the backbone, and so you're uh, you're talking about months to years to just get the replacements uh, there. So, is this a good posture for our society to be in to have this kind of vulnerability and not have replacements? I think the answer is sounding no. That uh, if you if there's a, um, any chance of knocking these out, um, you better um, have some kind of strategy in mind for dealing with it. An alternative way of um, addressing this question goes back to your point, which is, okay, if you as a policymaker or as a group of policymakers decide there are certain things that have to survive, you know, come hell or high water, no matter what happens in space weather, um, then you better think about ways to protect those. You better build in kind of uh, protective circuitry or other kinds of things, a blocking technology to make sure that your transformers aren't knocked out. And that's another um, policy discussion that needs take place. Other questions? This side of the room deserves, okay. Can I? Yeah, that's a good question too. I think that um, the implementation of the Wang Shi, the RG cone model has um, improved things quite considerably. And in fact, the, the work between the space weather um, forecasters and the scientific community has been continually improving that. It went from perhaps very large error bars on just the time of arrival of coronal mass ejections to reduction of that down to a few hours uncertainty about the arrival time. And uh, it's getting better and better. And, um, and I think this is a, an important lesson for us all is to um, not just assume you can develop a model, throw it over to, and then everybody stops work on it. This has to be, as it is in terrestrial or tropospheric weather, continual feedback between the users and the providers in order to continue. 
improve the forecasting capability. Yeah. Yes, Maria. Yeah, a very good question. We did see a reappearance of the storage ring kind of feature uh, in uh, March again. So uh, an, another paper in preparation about that. But the circumstances seem to be um, at their, they're sort of clearing up in everyone's mind, which is that first you need to have produced quite an intense entire outer zone population. And then you need a sort of a Goldilocks kind of a, a shock wave to come through, strong enough to wipe out part of the outer belt, but not strong enough to wipe out the entire outer belt. And if you do that, then you can leave that residual population. And then if the system relaxes so the plasma pauses out further, then those particles are in there. They're sort of stored. They're immune to all the external forcings. And they sort of stay there. And they stay there, uh, again, until you have a strong enough, uh, another shock that comes through that really wipes it out. So, so it's really a balancing act. And that's, that's sort of the radiation belt story, I think, is it's a balancing act between source strength and losses. So uh, I expect that this is not an uncommon thing. It's probably occurred more than once, and well, at least twice, I know. So, good questions? Yes? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are many techniques that people are trying to, to find to you know, see effects. So if you can look at energetic particles or radio emissions from the uh, that are associated with the shock, um, these are all very useful tools. And uh, I think it's like most things that um, using one tool, you can be sort of successful. But using multiple techniques, you may be able to greatly improve the um, forecasting efficacy. And that's really the, the goal here is to and um, I can't emphasize strongly enough how having multiple views of the system to be able to see as stereo, to see things from the side as well as the front. So you triangulate and really see um, and can get an accurate fix on direction and speed. That's an important thing. Yeah. Very broad, kind of broad and diffuse, yeah. Well, the, and, and the biggest problem we have is, uh, and everybody knows this, is that we can't predict with great accuracy what the orientation of the interplanetary magnetic field is. And unless we know whether the field is northward or southward, we don't know how well it's going to couple in through reconnection into the Earth's magnetosphere. If we don't know that, we don't know whether this is going to be a wimpy or a very powerful geomagnetic storm. And so um, that's sort of what. Again, what I have argued in this uh, new paper is that um, we don't know those things, but we do. We maybe now have a handle on how extreme things can get, and we have direct measurements of the magnetic fields and so forth. So we can really model this and play it through. Um, it can be sort of wargamed through the uh, power grid um, people, so they can really take this information and say what would be the consequences. But but you're right, we, we can't quite, we don't have quite the precision to get exactly where the shock is. Maybe good enough for some space weather forecasting business, but we don't know the interplanetary field orientation yet. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very good thought, and I think that's where a lot of people are trying to Understanding the context from which something emerged may give you some, some clues about the orientation of the field enough to at least get an idea. I, you know, I would, what I would say is that what we need to do is sort of probabilistic forecasting. That is, look at a range of different possibilities of field orientation and look at what the most extreme um, likely circumstance would be if it was the worst possible field orientation. That at least helps to scale it for uh, f uh, policymakers and forecasters and things like that. Um, be, you know, the, I think a good motto is be prepared for the worst, hope for the best kind of thing. Hope is not a strategy, as they say. Any other questions? Okay, I guess we're, uh, Fran tells me I'm done. Okay.